All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Masterful Conversations podcast, where we learn about leadership from the men who have served or are currently serving as Worshipful Master in a regular lodge of free and accepted masons. I am Brother Matthew Wagstaff, a proud past master of Eureka Lodge number 36 in Rochester, New York. We're currently serving as our Worshipful Master is Brother Jermaine Myers. And I'm with I am Past Master Mark Alexander of Sons of Kings Lodge number 123 in Brooklyn, New York. We're currently Brother Fitzgerald Boyce II serves our Worshipful Master. We both hail from the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the state of New York. We're currently serving as our Grand Master is Most Worshipful, Reverend Dr. Darren M. Morton. We have an honor today to have another past Grand Master on the show. Past Grandmaster Shelton Prescott from the Most Forceful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New Jersey here. But before we get into his introduction, we do have a quick disclaimer. Views and opinions on this show are our own. We do not represent our various lodges and uh, Grand Lodges. The, the If you have any questions, you can reach out to your particular offices in your particular jurisdictions. Absolutely. So with that, with that again, we are uh, pleased to have past Grandmaster Shelton J. Prescott with us today. Uh, just to give you a quick bio uh, uh, of uh, Brother Prescott. Uh, he served as Worshipful Master in Integrity Lodge Number Fifty One, out of Patterson, New Jersey, uh, for the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New Jersey on the years two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, two thousand eighteen and 2019 and now what makes that really interesting is that you heard the dates for him serving as worship master he also as you can tell as you can see is the past grandmaster where he served as grandmaster in the most worshipful prince hall grand lodge in new jersey in the years 2015 through 2017 and so in between those bookends of worship master he served as grandmaster in new jersey so we definitely want to hear about um that leadership journey and that story there he has also served, um, he's in his sixth term serving as worthy patron uh, in Fidelity Chapter number 16, Order Eastern Stars, Prince Hall affiliated, as well as many other houses. He's a member of, of all the Masonic body houses as well. And so he could certainly tell us a little bit more about his journey in those other houses and, and any leadership um, traits or characteristics or lessons that he's learned from those other houses. So with that, we want to welcome you, past Grandmaster Sheldon Prescott, to the show. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate what you brothers are doing regarding Masonic scholarship. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And for those who are watching right now, we do appreciate all of the love and the support. Please like, subscribe, share this, this show. I know this is going to be one of those episodes where you're going to learn a lot. You're going to hear a lot of things that you may have never heard before. Um, the story is unique, and uh, so please make sure you share this with as many people as possible, especially if you receive some value out of it. So, uh, Past Grandmaster Prescott, you know, we talk about leadership on this show, um, and so we really want to know your background. We want the people to know about your journey to the east of your lodge, uh, of Integrity Lodge number 51. Before we go to the grandies, let's talk about your journey into the uh, east in your lodge. Um, when were you raised, and what was that journey like going to the east? Okay. Uh, before I even explain any of that, I just want to give a shout out to my worshipful master, uh, right worshipful Dalton L. Price of Integrity Lives number 51. And uh, also give a shout out to our grandmaster, the most worshipful uh, Clyde H. Horton Jr., who is our 92nd most worshipful grandmaster. And uh, I, would be, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge your most worshipful grandmaster, the Reverend Dr. Darren M. Morton, who was my 33rd classmate, the Herbert M. Douglas class of 2013, so I'm looking forward to seeing him doing some awesome things in the, in the Empire State. Um, I was raised on June 8th, uh, 2002. Um, obviously at, at Integrity Laws number 51, we were the centennial class, um, 100th anniversary class. We were chartered um, on December 29th of 2002, but prior to that, the Lodge was organized on March 3rd, 2002. Um, the, the young man who petitioned me was a brother who was a member of my church by the name of Right Worshipful James P. Brown. And um, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude for him just putting his reputation on the line to request a petition for me. Um, I had three other brothers 
who were a part of the same class, right works for Donnell T. Isaac, um, who is currently our district deputy grandmaster of the Seven Masonic District. And he is close to getting his emeritus status. We have brother Darren Jackson, who is uh, our key component with our Temple Association. Um, you know, that's our business arm of our lodge and he's doing an outstanding job there. And a brother by the name of Stephen Mazzone, who wasn't a member of Integrity Lodge, he was a member of Silver Star Lodge number 45 in our district, but they weren't conferring degrees at that time. So he got all three of his degrees with us. And he was also a part of our study class. Uh, so I want to shout him out. He actually lives in South Carolina now and doing some great things down there. Um, and I also want to shout out uh, my dean of instruction during that time, the late James Lester Liverpool, who was just an outstanding brother of service, a tremendous master mason. Um, you know, he wasn't one of those brothers who was pretentious or, or arrogant. He was very unassuming, but he was very knowledgeable, um, very humble in his approach. And he just knew a lot about not only Masonic scholarship, but also just being a Mason in general. Um, so after being raised on June 8th of 2002, um, the next step for us was to get our, our certificate of proficiency. Um, in the jurisdiction of New Jersey, uh, you have a particular window where you have to fulfill your certificate of proficiency. So that's pretty much like your, your, your passport mm -hmm. to petition any other auxiliary in ancient craft masonry. Um, I don't know how much that is being enforced now. I digress. But um, that is pretty much the constitutional requirement that you do get a certificate of proficiency. And then also within our constitution, you can't petition no other Masonic body unless you stayed in the lodge for at least one calendar year. Oh, excuse me, for one year. Um, that, that is a requirement within our jurisdiction. Uh, once again, I don't know where the reinforcement or enforcement is with that, um, but that is a requirement. I didn't petition to go anywhere for about a year and a half. Um, after I was raised. Um, but, but, but let me just say, after being raised and getting my certificate of proficiency, I, I think it was important for myself and my other three classmates uh, for us to set short-term and long-term goals for ourselves, especially those of us who had aspirations to be worshipful master. In addition to that, I think not only the person who petitioned for us um, being responsible for us coming into the lodge. But I think we also needed mentors to kind of help us navigate, you know, this entire process of becoming a worshipful master or just knowing the functions of the lodge. Mm -hmm. uh, so when setting short-term and long-term goals for myself, the one thing that I noticed right away is that the lodge had a lot of norms and expectations and traditions already set in place. And, um, it was one of those. It was one of those things where you you said to yourself, you know, these petition, uh, these traditions were established before I got here, and these expectations were established before I got here. And I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of energy, um, but I need to make sure that these expectations are being fulfilled, because the, what I learned immediately is that when you are fulfilling some of the expectations that are already in place a lot of those brothers are a little bit more open to your ideas, all right? And some things that you want to bring to the lodge. Um, they're just not going to turn the keys over to you right away because they want to know if they can trust you. They want to know if you are committed. And more importantly, they want to know if you care. Uh, so setting short-term and long-term goals for myself, uh, one of the biggest yeah. things I wanted to do is to try to learn some of the lectures, right? I was intrigued by the brothers who learned the lectures and presented the lectures while we were getting our inner apprentice fellow craft and master mason degree. And I was highly impressed by that. Um, so I wanted to learn the, um, the, uh, the, the, the lecture work of the inner apprentice degree. Um, that was one. And then I also wanted to participate in one of the community service committees and also a fundraising committee um, while also serving as senior steward. And then I went from senior steward the senior deacon, I leapfrog the masters of ceremonies. I leapfrog junior deacon. I went right to senior deacon. But I, but I will say this: that even though I was a senior steward at the time, I learned the lectures of the end of the apprentice degree, and I was also doing some of the work of the junior deacon and the senior deacon when we were conferring degrees as well. 
Uh, so I did have some experience there along with the master's ceremonies. Um, then when I got to the senior deacon seat, you know, I kind of took it to another level. I wanted to make sure I learned the middle chamber and the letter G. Um, in our jurisdiction, the senior deacon is responsible for the middle chamber. It's almost kind of like a rite of passage before you get to the, uh, the seat of junior warden. So you I wanted to learn. Set up the beat. <laughs> absolutely. So <laughs> I, I, I wanted to learn the, the, uh, the, the middle chamber along with the letter G. And then this time around, I wanted to make sure that I chaired one of the community service projects and maybe chaired one of our fundraisers and then become a part of the board of trustees. And then when I became a junior warden the following year, I did the same thing. So just to make a long story short, by the time I was senior warden, I have done all of the ritualistic work, the lecture work in the ritual um, for the exception of the installation of officers and balloting, you know, which is normally done by the worshipful master, um, including the funeral. Um, the first funeral I actually did was as a junior warden. Um, I did my first funeral as a junior warden for a brother by the name of Michael Hobson, um, you know, who was, you know, brother, he wasn't around as much, but he still was a committed brother and uh, he took ill and then eventually he transitioned. And uh, the first time I did that burial service, it was, I'm a school teacher. So we were on spring break and I'll never forget. It was the March of 2005. And um, I remember getting a call from the worshipful master. And he said, you know, some of the past masters in the lodge would like to meet with you later on in the evening to see you do the funeral service, mm -hmm. to make sure that you were good and you were proficient with it. Um, so I remember going down to the lodge and, you know, in our lodge during that time, it can be very intimidating for a new brother because we had a lot of gold collars in our lodge. We mm. had, you know, past deputies. We had, you know, Grand Marshal Emeritus. We had two past Grand Masters in my lodge. Actually, one was living in our area and one lived in Dublin, Georgia, who was still involved. So anyway, and how many down, how many brothers how many brothers in your lodge when you uh, when I time? came uh, when I came into the lodge in two thousand and two we were at around 70 brothers, somewhere in that range. Um, I'm going to say between 70, 75 brothers. Okay. Uh, but, 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 but there's some, some major changes that happened over, you know, yeah. a period of time, but, but, but anyway, went down. So the brothers, when I got there, the past master said to me, they said, listen, we want you to go over the entire funeral from the moment you get out of your car, everything you're <laughs> supposed to do, <laughs> up, until, up until doing the funeral and then once you're done you know you know we'll yeah. let you know. so i went through the entire funeral process explain what i did you know when i walk in the church you know i'm mm -hmm. looking at the layout, Lay you, know, out. Yeah. The body, you know just just making sure that everything is fine because you know as per our constitution you know we have certain directives that mm -hmm. we have as brothers who are going to do the service and yes. we have to make sure that information is conveyed to the family if they're okay with it. You know, we can't dictate what the family do, but we mm -hmm. let them know if we want to have a if you want to have a Masonic service, these are some of the things that we need to have in place. But anyway, um, so I went through it. They were fine with it, and um, I ended up doing the service. I did well, and from that point, I would get asked to do funeral service throughout the state of New Jersey. Um, on numerous occasions, I, I gotta I gotta interrupt you on this one because um this is this is actually amazing that I'm hearing this right now. Um, you said you were raised in 2002. Mm -hmm. You learned the funeral and the middle chamber by 2005. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The so the entire middle chamber mm -hmm. from operative mace to inspector mace all the way through, all the way uh, um five different orders of architecture five. And you the know. funeral. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. So, so brothers listening to this right now, <laughs> it can be done. Yeah, and you know, the thing, you know the thing is, and, and I will say this, I, I will, I will say these two parts before I, you know, talk about, about before I got the worshipful master. Um, it was easier for me to learn the ritualistic work when I had a complete understanding of it. Um, and 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 he, he, here's a little um, component that was very important to me. I'm a school teacher. So during the summer, you know, I had the summer months off, right? Mm -hmm. Even if I worked a little summer school job, I was done by 12 o'clock, 1230, give or take. So I used that entire window to learn most of the ritualistic work. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's why every year I can come back prepared to do some of the other degrees or some of the other lectures because I spent the summer learning that work. But I will have to read these things over and over and over again. You know, that's why Masonry used the word inculcate because you have to teach things by drilling it, right? So mm -hmm. I will read it over and over again just to try to get understanding. I will call brothers. I will look information up when I was confused about certain things. And I did that constantly. I would come down to the lodge and I would just go inside the lodge room by myself and go over these lectures with the chart just to make sure that I was aligned with everything that needed to be done. Um, the other thing is, you know, you hear a lot of brothers, you know, uh, um, talk about, well, you know, memorizing the work don't make you a good Mason. And I'm the first to say I completely disagree with that. And I'll tell you why. Um, first off, learning the ritualistic work, number one, builds discipline. All right. For, for, for people to sit down and to put the time in to learn this work. I think is important. It, it, it builds discipline and it also builds focus. That's number one. Number two, I think it keeps the mind sharp. When, when, yeah. when, you're, when you're reading information, you're trying to learn information, um, it keeps the mind sharp, whether old or young. Mm -hmm. Number three, it allows the mind to learn more concepts. When you're constantly trying to learn information and put it to memory, it gives a window and or an opportunity to learn more concepts. Um, number four, I think once you put the time in to learn the work, you, you have a greater appreciation for it. And finally, yeah. number five, I think it's the standard. That's our standard. We can't compromise our standards just for sympathy. Um, if, if our standards is for us to learn the work and to put the time and to do the work, you know, wh why can't we do it? Now, does everyone learn the same way? Absolutely not. But people have to find the best practice in which they learn the best, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that may take a little bit of time. But this is not a, a sprint. Craft masonry is not a sprint. It is a marathon, right? It's a way of life. So time, patience, and application, that's not cliche. That's real. So if it's going to take you a little bit more time to learn certain things or to work, then you have to put that work in. Also, with a lot of brothers, <laughs> um, this is some of the most studying they've ever done in their life. Yeah. You know, there, there are brothers who never studied this much. And to have a brother sitting in the house on a Friday night trying to learn the charge for the end of the apprentice degree, opposed to doing other things, mm -hmm. um, that says something about the brother's development. And I yeah. think that does help, help a brother become a better master mason. Obviously, that's not the only thing, but I think it does help. Uh, when people say that it doesn't make anybody any better. I, I just, you know, I disagree with that completely. So by the time I was a uh, senior warden, um, I was able, like I said, I conferred a lot of degrees. I chaired committees, whether it was community service projects, whether it was fundraising committees. I also served as the chairperson of the Craftsman Club during that time, which was the fundraising arm of our lodge. Um, I also served as a board of trustee member, but when you're going in the seat as worshipful master by virtue of your office, you couldn't be an elected board of trustee member, right? You couldn't have two elected positions, especially if you were a principal officer in the lodge. Um, so when I ended up going in as worshipful master, I think the brethren had a lot of confidence that I would do a good job. That doesn't necessarily mean that we didn't have conflicts or we didn't have fundamental differences, but I don't mm -hmm. think that there was no question that I had a body of work. And the fact that I had a body of work, I think the brothers were a little bit more open to supporting me and uh, following whatever vision that I had in place at that time. Um, I think it's a little bit more difficult when somebody is standing in the East telling the brothers what to do and they haven't done it themselves. Um, it's not going to come across the same way. But when people have a body of work, and you know what? Some people have taken other journeys to get to the East. It's not a cookie cutter process, but you still have to have some form of body of work by the time you get to the East. And, uh, you know, thanks be to God, you know, I had a, a, a very productive year. We were blessed. You know, we got lodge of the year for not only the district, but also the state of New Jersey. Oh, nice. I was get worshipful wow. master of the year. So, you know, and it was a very competitive year. You know, past Grandmaster Tysan Rasul Dawood 
was a worshipful master. The same worst, okay. Self and, um, right, uh, most of the right? Master Jeffrey Spann. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a host of right worshipful brothers who were mm-hmm. serving at the same time. Yeah. Oh, uh, he served as, as Spann yeah. was Spann is your classmate too. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, we, we we came in the masonry together as well in 2002. I think Tyson came in one year before us. Um, but as far as worshipful master, yeah. um, we all serve worshipful master at the same time. Yeah. yeah for, for those that don't know, they also then went back to back on in the grand line. So that's yep. crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They say yeah. they say birds of feather. They say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I love it. I love yeah. it. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm curious since you got the uh the the lodge of the year and worshipful master of the year, like what are some of the things that you focused on that year? Like what what were some of your your pillars in that that first year of worshipful master? Um, I think one of the things we try to do is um, collectively as a lodge is have a better form of communication and strengthening the bonds of brotherhood. Um, a, another thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to improve our fiscal responsibilities, right? We wanted to try to get that a little bit more on par because one of the brothers who was, who was a longtime secretary in the lodge, he actually stepped away because of health reasons. So we wanted to make sure that fiscally that we were going to be not only responsible, we were going to be sound. Uh, so so we, we had some improvements there. Our community engagement was enhanced. Um, not only we had community service projects that were within the lodge, but we also had a host of them outside the lodge. And we built a lot of re- relationships with grassroots organizations and civic organizations and also the public school district. Um, so I think from that standpoint, um, you know, we, we, we made some significant improvements. Now, obviously with fundraising, we did, you know, a solid job with our fundraisers, with our Grand Lodge raffle, which is pretty much one of our biggest fundraising arms in the state of New Jersey. Um, then in addition to that, all the other programs that we annually have. And yeah, it just, it worked out. It worked out. The brothers were very, very supportive. Um, one thing I can truly say, my brothers, I was blessed. Um, anytime I was in a position of leadership, I had tremendous support. So anytime I would go visit another lodge or go to another district or go to another jurisdiction, I always had a significant number of brothers that travel with me. And, you know, hopefully that was a testament to the leadership. Um, On top of that, the line officers, we had a a real solid relationship because, and I'll tell this to any worshipful master, any person in leadership who have officers, um, you have to meet with your officers. We would have um, officers meetings the week of our first lodge meeting of the month. We would go over everything that was dealing with the lodge, the communications, just so whereas when we had our lodge meetings, everyone was on par. Now, we didn't try to control the lodge meetings, but if anybody is going to make sure that the worshipful master is running an efficient and proficient lodge meeting, the support should come from his officers first. And I think part of that reason, that's why we had meetings over and over and over again. We will also have school of instruction right after our line officers meeting just to make sure we were on task. The other thing... Um, that I try to institute institute my first year, first time of serving as worshipful master, uh, we had past masters who served as advisors to the officers. Now the past masters council was my advisor, but I had specific past masters who served as advisors to the senior warden and junior warden. Then I had a past master who was an advisor to the deacons. Mm-hmm. I had one who was an advisor to the stewards. You understand what I'm saying? So whereas they're not just hearing a lot of these things from me, they're getting reinforcement from those brothers who served in the office before me. And I think that was very helpful as well. I wound up doing that same thing as far as having like an advisor for the deacons and for the stewards and had that same thing. Right. And and I actually I and I actually had the same philosophy as a grandmaster. Mm -hmm. You know, we would we would have cabinet meetings every month. And even after our ca- uh, cabinet meetings, we will always go out and have lunch. We will fellowship for hours just to have a good time and the brothers getting a chance to, you know, talk about some other things outside of craft masonry because we spent so much time in the morning during our cabinet meeting talking about these things. But I wanted to make sure that we had that balance. Um, so, so we will always have some type of fellowship after, 
you know, our cabinet meetings. And I would do the same thing in the lodge as well. And I thought that was important for the bonds of brotherhood. And this time yeah. period was 2006. Mm -hmm. So this is this is pre iPhone where everything was yep. recorded. You could do pictures and upload them on social media and all this right. sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you you I don't know how you make got the word out about these things. Uh, you know, there still was email around and stuff like that. But you right by somebody had a disposable camera was taking pictures and, and then sending them off to somebody. Yeah, <laughs> we, 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 like that. <laughs> yeah, we had we had a brother in our lives that you know, God rest his soul, he passed away during COVID. The late brother George Peters, he will always take pictures, um, you know, at all of our lives, meetings and activities, whatever we were, even if we were just sitting around, just talking, chopping it up, he would take pictures for, you know, during those moments. Um, the other thing is what was very helpful, and I actually use it as this deputy grandmaster, grandmaster is the calling post. Yeah, the calling I, post. To, yeah. to me, I think the calling post is, is important. Even if the brothers can't answer the call, you know, my message is going to go through voicemail. So they're going to be able to hear it. Um, so break that down for also, those who don't know what that is. Break that down. Uh, the, the calling post was a, was pretty much an automated service that you would, that you would get through, you know, whatever app that they had. Robocall. Like, robocall. That time. Yeah, like a robocall. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. a robocall. And I would use that, you know, shoot, maybe two, three times a day sometimes. It depends <laughs> on what the message was. They stopped yeah. answering your phone calls because they thought it was a robocall, didn't they? Yeah, so, so they <laughs> Once they know the number, that's it. Yeah, 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 they, right. they, they see my phone number, so a lot of yeah. times they say hello, and then it's actually me just, you know, giving yeah, my message. Good. But, yeah. you know, I had I used, I used to use one particularly for the line officers, and then I had one for the past master's council, then I had one for the entire lodge. And it was, mm -hmm. it was cheap. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I did robocalls too. Brother stopped answering my calls because I did the robocall. It's like this guy, I know it ain't him. It's the robo guy. Right. And, and, and I will have and I will have past masters, you know, in my lives when we're talking about good and welfare. You know, some of the past masters will stand up and say, you know, works for master, can you please you know stop with the automated calls and stuff like that? And, but it was cool, it was all in fun. It was right. all in fun because the moment you stop, they're gonna notice that. Yep. Mm -hmm. They say something about it. So, you know, during that time, we were still, get, you know, mailing out monthly communications through the yeah. mail. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did a few of them via email, but the calling post is where I got the most response. Okay. And, and they can't say you they don't have communication. That's the important thing. They a have the communication. Yep. They got no the excuse. No exactly. excuse. Yep. Exactly. It's a few things that you mentioned. And I had a question. Well, you, I don't know if you was halfway joking or it's something in your jurisdiction because you, you said somebody is close to getting emeritus. Is there a time thing, particularly with yes. New Jersey? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so you yep. 12, 12, conse 12 consecutive years mm -hmm. in the position. Okay. So mm -hmm. he has served District Deputy Grand Master for 10 consecutive years. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, he, he was very serviceable, did an outstanding mm -hmm. job. And once again, like he's one of my classmates. So very proud of him. Very proud of our class. And all, we always brag about it that we had the best class in the history of the lodge, you know, obviously they're going to be other brothers like, nah, we had the best class, cool. but um, yeah, just as yeah. like your grandmaster, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we're like our 33rd class is kind of like the grandmaster class. Okay. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have in our class, we have about seven to eight brothers in our 33rd class that were grandmasters. As of right now, we have two sitting grandmasters in our 33rd class now. Uh, most worshipful Morton and most worshipful Johnny Eves out of the jurisdiction of Kansas. Okay. I mean, I know we had a few too. I can't number any more. I know we got one right now in mind and shook. Right. <laughs> in in Shook's yeah. class. Yeah. Um, but um I uh, another question. So I know you mentioned about having a goal. So you particularly had a goal to become worship master? Or... Well, you know, at first, yeah. <laughs> and and I think I think it's important that brothers who are in positions of leadership or brothers who are, whether that's an elected officer or an appointed officer, we're all essentially leaders, right? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, but the Office of Worshipful Master, if it's done properly, um, it's gonna inspire others to try to do the same thing. I, yeah. I, I just believe that. Um, you know, leaders teach best according to their life and they must set the example in all things. So whatever we want our lives to be, we must first be ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because some of our most forceful and compelling arguments 
will fall on deaf ears if our words are not parallel with our actions. So I think that is very, very important. And uh, when I came into the lodge, um, Brother Benny L. Cook, and I forgot to even acknowledge him uh, when I first came into Masonry in 2002, he was our worshipful master, our centennial worshipful master. He actually grew up around the corner from me. I didn't even know he was a member of the lodge. And uh, he was an outstanding worshipful master, um, not only ritualistically, um, but also with um, Masonic knowledge, Jewish prudence, community engagement, uh, because he's a political guy. Uh, and at the time, he was one of the high ranking officers in his union, and he did some outstanding work there. So he was politically connected in the community, and he was a very efficient and proficient worshipful master. So just to watch him confer our degrees, our interdependence, fellow craft, and master mason degree, I was very impressed by that. And, um, you know, I didn't know how to get there. I just knew that someday I wanted to be worshipful master. And, okay. um, and I knew in the lodge, I mm -hmm. knew somewhere along the line that there were certain things I had to get done before I could even think about people considering me for the office of not mm -hmm. only worshipful master, just junior warden. Yeah, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's that's good to, good to know because I I know um you know being inspired to become worship master is one thing I know back in my well you know I was in Prince Hall at first when I first became worship master in my old jurisdiction I can't say it was inspiration it was like okay I I'd want to be better than this guy because <laughs> I need to improve the lodge and something like that so it was usually um let's see I'm with this guy but this brother uh, brother Mitchell uh, may God rest his soul but um. That was my inspiration to come worse from a bad side, but you know, it would just try to improve the large in the way you look at it. So that's mm -hmm. where my inspiration on that. And one thing you mentioned as far as those things you had to accomplish to become worship master, and you knew within yourself, and you talked about how like there was additions and stuff you knew to uphold. What I call I call that as as it's pretty sure it's probably in your insulation service too, when they talk about holding the key to a man's heart, right? So I call that the keys to a past master's heart. <laughs> you got to do Absolutely. those additions to get them on your side. That's the keys to their heart. And once you got them, you basically okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so when, right. So when you hear when you hear past masters talking about, you know, you, your brothers have to support your lodge and the lodge programs. You have mm -hmm. to go to district meetings. You have to go to seminars. You have to learn your ritualistic work. Um, it would be wise for you to learn the seat ahead of you, so just mm -hmm. in case, so you're prepared. Because we used to have move up night in my lodge, okay. um, mm -hmm. and even in our district meetings, sometime our district deputy grand master, uh, when I was a pillar, uh, right words for Charles E. Leach, God rest his soul. Uh, sometimes he will randomly pick pillars to close the meeting, the district meeting. Mm -hmm. So okay. yeah, so sometimes mm -hmm. he will he will say, brother so and so, brother senior warden. From King Solomon Lodge number 19, you're going to close a lodge meeting, a district meeting today. Because we open and close our lodge meeting, our district meeting. Yeah, district meeting oh. in lodge room? Yeah, I was about to ask about yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. So, so nice. it, it was, it was practice, practice for us. Yeah, it's yeah, a good so practice. Sometimes he would call on pillars to do that. And, um, you know, he called on me one time to close when I was junior warden. I was able to close the lodge as a junior warden. And, um, you know, people don't forget those things. So you have past matches like, wow, this, this young boy... <laughs> You know, this young boy done closed a lives meeting. He know how to open and close a lives meeting. You know, he's only the junior warden. And they remember those things. Yeah. So mm -hmm. now you start planting these seeds as a junior warden, as mm -hmm. a senior warden, right? For programs that you want to at least flourish a little bit by the time you work for master, you know, you have these brothers on your side to kind of push this envelope because they've seen you do some of the, the work and some of the traditions that they already have in the lodge. Yeah, and I think it's that's good. important. I would say it's good to hear that uh, the the past masters, this older season members, doesn't look at your what what I'm gonna say go get in this in a negative light because I've heard that from other people where you right. see a brother that's trying to work all that hard doing it and then they're like, ah, he's doing all that. He just want to be a want to be this, want to be that. Mm -hmm. When he's just really trying to do his best to do the best, you know, for the job, for the work, and everything like that. So it's good to hear that you have you had at this time and hopefully you still do our uh, members out there that's encouraging young men that it are sounds like, um, out there working. It sounds like that's the culture. Like that's the, yeah. the culture of their lodge was to like to do that work. And some leader before past grand master mm -hmm. set that stage in terms of like what the culture is going to be. And so he inspired someone, inspired someone who inspired past grand master. At, at least that's what I'm hearing right now, because mm -hmm. 
you get when you get that culture where brothers know what's expect what's expected of them mm -hmm. um and they buy into that culture you know as a leader being able to have people create the environment for success is a big part of being of being an effective leader and so it sounds like somebody created that environment you had it in yourself as grandmaster to to do that you know no one made you do that you had it in your you had it in your spirit where you first became a mason and so um it seems like that culture and I, i'm just very 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 curious about like how you you kept that going like the, the amount of time energy and attention it takes for other men not let alone you doing it but to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have other men buy into that meeting all the time i don't know if they have families with kids and sports and all this like how do you all how do you get that culture where no matter what you got going on outside of masonry you were able to spend the time do it proficiently not just memorize it but actually do it proficiently too right well the, i think one of the other things with when, when you're going through the process right of learning the ritualistic work um the, the one thing i expected of our officers is to be proficient in your parts okay first off um, be proficient in your ritualistic opening, your ritualistic closing. When we confer degrees, when you have to do your seat, just make sure you're proficient in those particular areas. Now, if you decide that you want to learn some things outside of that, traditionally, by all means, it's welcome, right? It's truly a blessing. When I came into the lodge, we had some outstanding ritualistic brothers, but a lot of them were past masters. So they were tired. Some of them were tired of constantly doing the work over and over again. Right. So to yeah. see somebody like, man, like this brother really wants to learn mm -hmm. the, the lecture work in the lodge. Like we don't even have to talk to him about it. Like this man is learning <laughs> at home, you know. Mm -hmm. Is that, that rare? Was a, that, that was, a, that was a, a blessing to the lodge. You know, I think right, go ahead. And right where for no. the, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No, he, he said, "Is it rare? I, it might be. You know, it's it's a, it's on the lower side of brothers, lower percentage of brothers." Right. So, so all right. So, uh, uh, past master Wagstaff, you know, yeah. the expectation of a worshipful master is to have to be able to initiate pass and raise his brothers and bury his dead, right? Mm -hmm. And he should be proficient in all aspects of the lodge, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that is the uh, Masonic Jewish prudence, um, you know, Masonic education, um, fundraising, community engagement, empowering the brothers, leadership, all of those components fall under the umbrella of the Office of Worshipful Master, right? Now, if you had more Worshipful Masters fulfilling all of those responsibilities on a consistent basis, it would probably be the most intimidating position in ancient craft masonry. If they did, all that was required of the position. But sometimes because of, you know, the lack of participation, because of attrition or whatever you want to call it, um, sometimes we will, <laughs> we will compromise our expectations and our values because we have nobody else. Yep. Mm -hmm. So over a period of time, the bar starts to get lower, yeah. lower, <laughs> lower. And right. now when you see somebody doing those things, it's like, well, why are you doing all of that? Like, you don't have to do, like the worshipful mm -hmm. master should be a position of high prestige. The luster should never go away from the office. I don't think it does. You know, I just think that those individuals there are trying to tarnish it, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not fulfilling all the res responsibilities needed to be there. So we make excuses for them, right? We make excuses for them not being able to do specific things. Oh, you know, you don't have to learn all of that stuff just as long, you know, you do a consistent job and the brothers get behind them and you, they'll be okay. But is that the expectation of craft masonry? Absolutely not. You know, and that's one of our major, major problems when we talk about the position of worship, no any position of leadership. And then a, a, another thing is we, we will look at the, we will look at, those individuals who've been in the organization for a long period of time or they have other titles you know credentials in a lot of instances don't equate competence you know you know we we, we see somebody who is highly credentialed but they're really not competent and i talked about this in a in, a, in another masonic um podcast i mean that's masonic deception 
That's Masonic. <laughs> Not Masonic Deception. Deception. Oh, I, love, man. I love that term. That's another one. That's another one. <laughs> no, <I'm> not... <laughs> Masonic Deception. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> because you know we think because certain people have years and years of experience, mm-hmm. and they have um, office positions in other houses. Sometimes in some of those other auxiliaries, all you have to do is show up. You'll fall right into a position because yep. there's no one there. You understand mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So we think that's impressive. But in actuality, the, the position that works for master or positions in the lodge are so demanding, right? A lot of times we'll walk away from that and go to these other auxiliaries because they're a lot easier. Mm. Yeah, very, definitely. very interesting. Yeah, we can we can dig into that one for a that, long that, that's time. another that's another hour. That's a whole <laughs> nother hour right now that, that we don't we have we're gonna keep it positive too, and we have a couple other Pretty good questions. Then we got a, a huge okay. story that you have that we need to dig into. Yeah, exactly. but thank you for going down that rabbit hole with us for a minute. Mm-hmm. Yep. No Let problem. me ask my uh, our our classic question. What do you, what does you uh, see as effective leadership? Okay. Um. And I, I know you emailed me yeah. <laughs> some of the questions. Yeah. Um. I I think first off, I think effective leadership from just a, a general definition. I'm going to say is someone who has the ability to ignite a flame, right? That is too bright for others to put out. All right. They just have that skill. Um, They also have the ability um, to connect with others um, that some people just can't reach. But if we're going to talk about the office of worshipful master, um, I'm going to say that some of the characteristics of an effective leader is a worshipful master, someone who is principled, all right? Um, They have a strong value system. They're not gonna compromise it. They're not gonna deviate from their values uh, for their own personal agenda. Everything is because of the organization of the lodge. I think an effective leader should have pride in their work. Um, Pride was actually one of the acronyms that I use when I was grandmaster, it was my motto. It was the acronym for personal responsibility and demanding excellence, not only of yourself, or, the, or but those around you. I just think that there's a clear distinction with people who are prideful and people who take pride in what they do, right? A prideful individual has like this delusion of grandeur that this overdeveloped sense of self-worth, which is out of proportion with reality. But people who take pride in what they do they want to try to perform every single task at a high level of aptitude. They don't do it for the applause. They don't do it for different positions. They do it for the love and purpose of the work. So if you can't do it right, don't do it at all. So I think an effective leader should have pride in their work. I also believe that they should be purpose-driven. And purpose-driven, what I mean by that is, not only using their their gifts, skills, and talents to bless others, but to empower those officers to do the same thing, right? To maximize their skills, to bring out abilities that some of those brothers didn't realize they had. Another another thing about purpose-driven, I think uh, an effective leader should be someone who knows where the lodge stand, where the lodge is going, and how they're going to get there. Now that can be synonymous, not only the purpose, but it can be synonymous with vision. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that a brother should be productive. Um, I don't think that <laughs> the lodge should stay the same the way you inherited the lodge. I think you have to move the needle by any means necessary. Even if you improve one component of the lodge, I think you need to put the lodge in a better position than when you inherited the position. So whereas your successor has a chance to be successful. Um, and then finally, I think that an effective leader should be proficient. I'm not saying that they have to know everything, but they got to know something. And they have to be positioned, uh, pr- proficient. They have to be strong in their, their spot. And, um, you know, they're the duty expert, especially the office of works for master. So they should have a clear understanding of the basic practices of all of the entities within their lodge. Now, if you look at my lodge, we have three entities. We have the lodge where our charter authorizes us to meet, transact business, and do Masonic work. Then we have our craftsman club, which is our fundraising arm of the lodge. And then we have our temple association, which is the business arm of our lodge, because obviously a lodge can't own real property. 
So they should have a clear understanding of the operations of those entities on top of all of the responsibilities that are outlined in our ritual and our monitor as worshipful master. So if I had to go back, it would be principle, pride, purpose-driven, productive, and proficient. Love that. That's, that's another, with another five Ps, just in a different way. <laughs> just, another, <laughs> exactly. a different that's way, it. right? That's huh? it. Absolutely. Um, before, before we move on, can I please just ask a question about your background? Like, you can't let that pass. Who, who okay. is the gentleman yeah. in your background? Uh, yeah, um, these are some of you know my Masonic mentors and heroes. All right. Uh, some, some of these brothers are out of my lodge, and mm. uh, some of these brothers are brothers throughout the jurisdiction of New Jersey. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. You um to that same vein, talking about the brothers that, who met, are behind you or um the brothers who were past masters that you you gave them jobs. We talk about a lot, and I, I don't know if we talked about a lot on here. But giving brothers a job and giving them something to do keeps them engaged. Um, and oftentimes um, it works and then sometimes it doesn't work. You you appoint somebody to a space and they just, you know, can't can't fulfill it for whatever reason. Um, we talk about accountability a lot, too, in the job of a leader to hold not only himself or herself for the sisters who are watching, um, but other people accountable for what they said they're going to do and, and what they um uh, you know, are, are being charged with doing. And so I'm curious, just as a leader, um, when you gave, for example, the past masters the duty to be the mentors to those different officers, um, and even your principal officers, your wardens, like, how did you hold them accountable? And like, I always phrase this, and people get mad at me when I say like, this is a volunteer organization, like, yeah. nobody, nobody's getting paid fiat dollars, or mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, or whatever the, the currency is. Um to be here. There's other things that we get that are of value, mm -hmm. uh, but this is a volunteer, for all intents and purposes, a volunteer organization. How do you hold these men accountable? Um, were they always, or do they just hold themselves accountable? You just are just a fortunate brother that have very accountable people in your life uh, whenever you are in leadership. Well, I, I think one of the things is the, regardless to how reliable they are, you as a leader still have to hold the brothers accountable. Um, and you have to do that through constant communication. Um, I'm, I'm the type of brother, I don't like to micromanage. If I give you a responsibility, I trust that you're going to fulfill the responsibility. Now, prior to you doing that, we're going to have a conversation. So to get the past masters, and I didn't get all the past masters to participate, but the ones who did participate, they were willing to do the job. Um, but I did have a conversation with the past masters at the past masters council meeting. And I said, you know, it's important for our line officers to have advisors so they get reinforcement on a lot of things that I'm saying in the meeting. Because sometimes when you're the only person saying it over and over again, you know, it doesn't register after a while. They get a little aggravated by it or whatever. And that's perfectly fine. It's like us with kids, like with our children. Yeah. Like they can yeah. hear it yeah. all day from us. But yeah. as soon as somebody else right. say it, they're like, oh, now the light bulb right. went off. <laughs> right, right. So sometimes, so sometimes you have to use, you know, you have to use that component yeah. of reinforcement, right? So our brothers aren't children, by the way. I'm just trying to make an example. Yeah, so yeah, brothers, listen, yeah, not children. Right. So now when you hear past masters saying the same thing I'm saying. Now I'm looking at them like, see, <laughs> what did I tell you? So, so you have to be tactful um, from that standpoint. You just, you can't make people do anything. Um, and you know what? When it comes to ancient craft masonry, we all have autonomy on how we want to navigate through this thing. Nobody can make us do anything, but whatever we decide to do is of our own free will and accord. And if you're going to take on certain uh, positions, you have to be held accountable. It's just that simple. Now, obviously, there are brothers due to their vocations and other things that, that happen with, with, within their lives. Um, they're not able to make a complete commitment that we're asking of a lot of the officers and some of the other brothers. But whatever you can do to help the lodge, that's what I want you to do. OK, so you, we may have a brother who is I mean, we have brothers in our lodge now who are elected officials. So they're constantly on the go. OK, brother, I, I respect that. But when we have this program, um, can I count on you to spearhead this program? Because this is along your expertise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Br brother, give me the date right now in advance. When you get it approved, just let me know. 
and I'll take care of it. So sometimes we have to be tactful in that standpoint. It's not like we're lowering the expectations, but we're just maximizing the skills the best mm -hmm. way we can within our lives. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody's not going to have the same commitment, you know, traveling everywhere, or whatever. And and I think I'm a little uh, I'm in between I'm, I'm in the middle when it comes to traveling and going all of these places. Right. I'm a big fan of finding balance in your life. I think it's important. Um, when I first came into the lodge, it wasn't like that. I was trying to go everywhere. I was going to other lodge meetings. I was helping those brothers out. I was going to other lodges, conferring degrees for them. And you know what? I, I meant to mention that, Brother Mark Alexander. That's mm -hmm. how I met Derek Pritchard. Right? Okay. Was with Derek Pritchard, he yeah. went to a lodge in the Seven Masonic District. He saw me conferring a degree. And that's mm -hmm. how we ended up connecting. But okay. anyway, um, so when I first came into the lodge, I was trying to go everywhere and do everything. And there were other things in my life that were being neglected. And I had to try to find a way to get that balance. And I think it's important for us to have it because if I'm not good to some of these other aspects in my life that actually have more importance, right? I'm not going to be good to anybody else. So, you know, the 20, I, I have a great deal of appreciation for the 24 inch gauge because it teaches me to balance my time but I also love the hourglass because it teaches me not to waste my time. Mm. I think both of those aspects are very important when you're navigating through this, this thing that we love so dearly, craft masonry, especially when you get in a position of leadership. Um, those things are very, very important. Thank you. You definitely um, addressed the question I was about to get to anyway, as far as uh, you know, balancing your time and how did you do that with your family and everything coming up, going from worse, first thought into worse than the grand, because I know that takes a whole lot of time. Right. Um, well, you know, coming into the lodge, the, the one thing I wanted to do is to make sure as I got older in the lodge and I kind of learned like, you know, this is crazy. I can't be doing all of this stuff. I got to find that balance. But it got to a point where when I was in the lodge or serving in the Grand Lodge, I would share my passion for the organization with my family. And what I meant by that, I will always invite them to not only our fundraisers, but our community service projects. Uh, when we had community service projects, I will ask my wife to come and help us. I will ask her book club to come and help us. We have a Prince Hall Community Festival um, that I was blessed to, to start under my tenure as Grandmaster. And my wife's book club has been a part of that program ever since the inception. Um, when we would have other programs, I would invite uh, members from my school to come out and participate, my niece and nephew. So I think in order for them to have more of a, an appreciation for what you're doing in the organization, you have to kind of share that passion with them. And it's not always about selling tickets. No, this is we do this too. You know, we have fundraising projects and you know what, if you want to help out, if you want to donate towards our project or this fundraising endeavor, by all means, we appreciate that. So I, I think that was one of the things that I leaned on a lot more to get support, not only from brothers within the lives, but also my family and people in the community and even people on my job. That's huge. That's, that's, that is a good key, though, also to invite them. You know, we always trying to sell tickets to people. If you invite them to other things, they'll see what it's about. Maybe right. if they can be willing to support the financial parts of those, you know, fundraising yeah. efforts. And, you know, the other thing is, as um, not only as worshipful master, but as grandmaster, when we would have our cabinet meetings, um, there are times where I would delegate some of, like, some of the big projects, I would delegate it to some of you know, my officers, whether it was the deputy grandmaster, senior junior, because that gave them a chance to get that experience of being a grandmaster. Mm -hmm. Not only at dinner dances, but let's just say if I had to go to Connecticut for their annual session and our Holy Royal Arts was having their annual convocation during the same time, you know, I was sending the deputy grandmaster there and I'm saying to the deputy grandmaster, like, listen, you only one heartbeat away. So I want you to go in there with the mind frame and the approach of a grandmaster, because everything that I knew, I wanted to share with the cabinet because they were only one, two, and three heartbeats away. So whereas if something happened to me, they were able to step in and we mm -hmm. wouldn't miss, miss anything, right? And um, during the time I served as grandmaster, um, I was only in for one month 
and I broke my ankle at a, a, um, a community service rally that we did in partnership with um, the People's Organization for Progress, Larry Ham, Dr. Cornell West. Um, you know, we had well over 100 participants from our Prince Hall family that was at this, this program. I broke my ankle there. Um, but even with that, I had to have a meeting with the Grand Cabinet. This is how we're going to move from this point on, you know, because I needed the help. I needed the help. And um, and even in my second year as Grandmaster, my mother passed away. Mm. Um, so just having these brothers around, you know, and we being on the same page and having these meetings and building relationships, you know, it, it made the process um, a lot smoother. And it was truly a blessing just to have those brothers around. Because I don't care who you are. Anybody at the top, you're going to have your own cross to bear. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to have a cross mm -hmm. to bear. Uh, Thomas, past Grandmaster Thomas Hughes, who's going in as Imperial Potentate, shout out to him. Um, his motto when he was Grandmaster was no cross, no crown. Because oh, everyone, because everyone yeah. has a cross to bear, <laughs> um, which I thought was, was significant. It's still apropos right now. Yeah. You mentioned the... Um some of the lessons or at least some of the leadership principles that you had as the worshipful master. It sounds like some of those things carried over a lot of those things carried over into your, as a grandmaster in terms of giving brothers a responsibility and accountability, training them up for the next position um, and build, building those relationships. I'm curious if your leadership, if your leadership style had to shift at all between you being worshipful master and grandmaster, did you have to shift your leadership at any, any degree? Um, I had to enhance it because I was dealing with the entire jurisdiction, right? I, ju I just wasn't dealing with those, you know, mm -hmm. 70 plus members. Um, on average, we would, you know, at, you know, lodge meetings on average, we would have 25 to 30 brothers at our lodge meeting. Um, but you know, as grandmaster, when you have your venues, you got the entire jurisdiction. So I had to enhance it. Um, and on top of that, you know, I, I learned a couple of, you know, nice little tidbits that helped me, you know, when I was grandmaster, when I served as district, district deputy grandmaster, mm -hmm. I started, I served as district deputy grandmaster right out of the seat as worshipful master, uh, past grandmaster, homo justice. He's actually in my collage. He's in the third row, um, to my right with the beard. Um, he gave me my first grand lodge appointment, um, as district deputy grandmaster. So I had a, a, a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful trial run as this deputy grandmaster um, in a district that was very difficult um, to actually run and operate as the grandmaster's representative. But I learned a lot from that position and some of my advisors who were past this deputy grandmasters and which, which was a blessing because some of those brothers was in my lodge. Uh, and then from the ritualistic side, um, I had to also learn some more administrative skills when I served as grand lecturer. I, I was wondering why I was like, I, I hear you being grand lecturer, all the stuff you were saying. I'm like, I hope he went that way a little yeah, bit. So, yeah. Right. So when I was district deputy grandmaster, that was under past grandmaster Homo Justice. And then when past grandmaster Thomas Hughes went in office, he appointed me as grand lecturer. And, you know, when it comes to the ritualistic work and it comes to some of the fundamental differences and some of the customs and traditions that some of the lodges have when it comes to the work and some of the disputes that they have, um, that's a major challenge. And you have to be prepared. You have to make sure that, you know, all of the lecturers that are under your, your, your responsibility, that they're on point as well. Um, because they have to go back in these districts and they have to convey this information that's coming from my office. And even when we had seminars, you know, seminars were always spirited. <laughs> they, they, they were spirited. Um, because, you know, we touched down a lot of, you know, very sensitive areas of the ritualistic work where some people felt it was a particular way, but based on the custodian of the works and, you know, doing our research is actually another way. And um, trying to get brothers to buy into that and trying to crack this culture of rebellion, because, you know, some lodges, when there are no visitors, no telling what's going on in the rooms. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have to be very careful. And as a grand lecturer, I couldn't be an absentee landlord. So I would go around the jurisdiction of New Jersey. I would make pop-up, you know, visitations. I did the same thing as a district deputy grandmaster in my district. 
um, because I want to know how you really living when you don't know I'm coming. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I think that was important as well. So some of those things and some of those best practices that I acquired as a deputy and grand lecturer helped me when I became a junior grand warden, senior deputy grandmaster, and grandmaster. You just try to get better every year, yep. you know. Mm-hmm. Yep, definitely one hundred percent. I was just thinking. I know you was going down that road a little bit. Do you have any uh, example of anything that was a difficult, very difficult, or just difficult that you actually overcame within the, in the craft as a leader? Um. Yes, when we shifted our grand session, mm. um, tradi- traditionally our grand session. Um, our annual communication, it will start on Sunday where we had our St. John the Baptist Day. Mm-hmm. Then it will be followed by our scholarship program and then our memorial service. So that would be mm-hmm. on Sunday. And then mm-hmm. Monday would be the start of our annual communication. Mm-hmm. We, will, we will conclude Tuesday afternoon slash evening. And then the sisters will come in on that mm-hmm. Wednesday. All right. Okay. Uh, w- when I came in as grandmaster, I wanted to do a trial run. If we can shift our annual communication to the weekend, because a large percentage of our members were working class, working, of course, mm-hmm. and those brothers would have to take vacation days and days off. They will lose time. They will lose money trying to commit themselves to the Grand Lodge. And, um, you know, they were trying to live up to their commitment, but it was at the expense of their usual vocations. And I'm looking at the percentages and a large percentage of our brethren were still working class. So mm-hmm. I made it perfectly clear when I came in office that I was going to, you know, go through this pilot program or a trial run where we can have our annual communications on the weekend. So what we did was we will start on Friday. Mm-hmm. We will start our annual communication on Friday. And then that evening we will have our memorial service. And then Saturday we will continue our business and conclude on Saturday. And then Sunday, we will have the St. John the Baptist Day service. I took the scholarship program completely out of that equation and I made Mm -hmm. that separate. And the reason why I did that as well, because we weren't getting a lot of participation with people outside of our Masonic body that was participating in our scholarship programs. Okay. When, Mm -hmm. When we decided to do it at mutual locations throughout the state of New Jersey in the early part of June, or towards the end of May, we would get, you know, a greater turnout of family and friends that came out to support the kids who were being honored. Um, nice. So, so that that was a that was that was a struggle at first mm-hmm. because you have a lot of brothers who are set in their ways in regards to the tradition that's been in mm-hmm. place. But masonry is not only a progressive science, but we have to be progressive thinkers. And use the best practices for the for the people that we have in our organization now. I don't want brothers who are dedicated to not only um, the Blue House in their grand session and the Order of the Eastern Star because they would have to take an entire week off. If they were going to stay for our our grand yeah. chapter session, Ozil mm-hmm. grand chapter, you know mm-hmm. they're taking vacation days to sit in meetings. Yeah, and I just thought that wasn't fair. Uh, so the first year I did it that way just for the brothers. And mm. then the following year, I had a conversation with, you know, the Grandworthy Matron who was mm. coming in and the sitting Grandworthy Matron to see if we can do one weekend and then they can do a weekend. So mm-hmm. whereas if you have working class members who normally work Monday through Friday, um, most of the brothers, if they only had to take a day, they would yeah, be better. one day, which was yeah. Friday. Mm-hmm. That, you know, so that worked out um, for us. We did that for a couple of years. And then because of the hotel structure and I don't know how they do their booking process, but we had to kind of go back to the old traditional way. But I mm. think somewhere along the line, we're going to get back into the weekend component because we have working class members more than retired members. Believe me, I know I'm taking most of my vacations around Freemasonry. I usually take the family during the week and then Freemasonry like towards the weekend or something right. like that. The way right. I needed yeah, to take so, time to do it. Yeah, so it's important. you know. And a lot of times we have programs you know, in our organization, we only think we can have programs on Friday and Saturday. Exactly. <laughs> right? Where, where where I've been, where I've been at other functions for other organizations, and they're having functions during the week. 
And yeah. I understand, you know, you know, people are, are involved in other houses and they have multiple meetings during the week. They may have, you know, multiple meetings within some of the committees within their lodge or their chapter. I get it. But, um, you know, we have to be a little bit more tactful in how we do specific things because, you know, some of the old traditional ways is just not working in 2024. Yeah. Speak, speaking of uh, being tactful and the way in which we, we move and, and progress, we got to address the elephant in the room here. How, talk to us about the, the, that story about you being Grandmaster and then going back into the East in your lodge to be Worshipful Master. How, what, what went into the thought process there? What, what was going on without giving too much of the details? If it's, you know, but, um, you know, talk us up, tell us, paint a picture, please. I, I'm so interested to hear about the going from the highest level, so to speak, in, in the, in the jurisdiction, going back to your lives that you love and that, that you, you, uh, want to see thrive, um, and put that time in again. Like you've, you climbed a mountain and then you go back to climb another mountain again, because there's more time. <laughs> So yeah, right. I would love to, I would love to see, um, hear that story. Right. Um, somewhere I read where it says the greatest investment in all ages have been encouragers and promoters of the art and have never deemed it derogatory to their dignity to level themselves with the fraternity. Amen. Uh, so that's first. I was a master mason before I was a grandmaster. I was a worshipful master before I was a grandmaster. You have no grand lodge unless you have subordinate lodges. The grand lodge is comprised of subordinate lodges and their members. If you don't have that and those lodges are not flourishing and they're not growing and developing, the grand lodge means absolutely nothing. So we have to start on the subordinate lodge side. Now, I will say, for the record, you know, my wife thought I was crazy but when I when I thought about going back in as worshipful master. But let, let me paint this picture um, for you. During that time when I was in office as grandmaster, and right when I came out as grandmaster in 2017, uh, my lodge suffered significant deaths. We actually had two brothers who were in line at the time two younger brothers who actually passed away three months apart uh, um, during that time. We, we, sorry. We, uh, right, yeah, there, there were some other brothers who passed away and then there were some brothers who relocated. Uh, so we're, now we're looking at the line and the brother who is coming in as senior warden, right? He doesn't want to leapfrog that position and go to work for master. He was honest with himself and humble enough to say, I need to learn a little bit more. I want to get the experience as a senior warden before I move. The brother who was actually serving as senior deacon, who was going to the position of junior warden, he wanted to stay, if possible, another year as senior deacon because he missed some meetings. There were some things going on, so he didn't want to move right away. Um, so we had a vacancy, not only in the worshipful master seat, eventually down the road, but it was going to be the junior warden seat Mm -hmm. as well so we had a past master's council meeting and you know we met periodically throughout well we meet periodically throughout the year and past masters are very vocal in a past master's council meeting because you have all of these experts in there right they have all of these wonderful ideas and best practices because they were the best they were king solomon when they were in office we all know of course yeah of course now <laughs> that's what we right, say right 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 that's right? What, right right right, <laughs> right, right. We, we become geniuses after the seat yeah. not while we're in the seat right we learn whole, our that's power. a whole bar right there that is a fact that <laughs> yeah, is yeah, we, we learn about our power once we come out of I, I digress but anyway um the, the past master's council if you want to hear a pin drop in a meeting just start inquiring about maybe a past master going back into one of those seats, whether it's a master, senior, junior warden, you won't hear anybody say anything during that time. And um, I was young. I still had the energy. And, um, you know, I told the brothers, I said, listen, um, I have no problem going back in as worshipful master. How old um, were you? At the time, I was 41. I, no, 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 no. Let, let me take that back. 
I was 43. I went in as grandmaster at 41. Mm-hmm. I came out of uh, out of out of grandmaster at, at 43. So from 2017 to 2018, I served as a lodge secretary because our lodge secretary actually moved to North Carolina because of his job. So we needed a secretary at the time. So I sat in the office of secretary for one year and uh, much respect to any fiscal officer, especially the secretary. I mean, that is, oh, Lord have mercy. It's a job. <laughs> what, 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 a job. Yes. What, what a job. <laughs> what what, what a, a job. job. And you know what? I am I am a average at best secretary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm honest to say that. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. So I served as secretary and then we had those issues where we had some brothers pass away and we had some issues, um, not only with our, our temple association, but our building did a lot of work that needed to be done. We had some brothers who relocated. So I told the brothers that I would go, I would go back in. If it's the will and pleasure of the lodge, I would run for the office of worshipful master. Um, and in past grandmaster, Reverend Salmon, if you look in my collage, he's actually the third to last brother on the top row. Okay. He's next to the brother with the bow tie, the white jacket. Yep. This mm-hmm. past grandmaster, Reverend James E. Salmon Sr. He actually was grandmaster in 85 and 87. Um, okay. He said to me, he said, he said, you can't do that. He <laughs> said, that's like, he said, that's like going from governor back to mayor. I said, I said, this is, I see, you know, he was just trying to c- kind of compare. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But, I, but mm-hmm. I, I said, that's politics. This is Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we don't, we don't operate that way. You know, if the, we need, brothers need help. The laws need help. If it's within the length of my cable toe, I'll help. Um, so I still had the energy. Um, I still had the motivation. Um, so I ended up running for the position. I think the difference between the first time I was worshipful master is the first time I was master, um, I had a lot of a lot to prove to the brethren because I was young and I had a fast track there, even though I had body of work, but it still was a fast track. And I was what, 32 years old when I went into the office of worshipful master. We didn't have worshipful masters at 32 years old at that time. Yeah. So I had a lot to prove to the brethren that, you know, this wasn't hype, that I was going to do a good job. The second time I went in, I had a lot to prove to myself. I wanted to make sure that I went in the office and did a great job, Um, not just kind of coast through the year, you know, based Mm -hmm. on my title as a past grandmaster and my laurels. No, I wanted to make sure that I was going to teach and set a good example for those brothers who was coming after me. And I tried to do everything in my power, you know, with the assistance of the council and the brothers to put that senior warden in the best position possible uh, to be worshipful master. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I had more fun my second year, this or the second time I mm-hmm. served than mm-hmm. I did the first time. The first time I tried to do everything, right? Um, you know, because I, like I said, I wanted to prove to the brothers that I was going to do a great job. But the second time around, it was like, listen, like, you know, you, you're confident, you have a plan, you know what you're doing, you know, certain things that you want to accomplish. Um, let's let's put these officers in position so they can kind of get some experiences experiences leadership wise and um let's let's have, have fun doing it and uh thanks be to god once again we got lodge of the year for the district <laughs> and worked for and i got worked for master of the year a lot of people said it wasn't fair because i wonder how that happened like hmm. yeah <laughs> well you gotta ask past the fix is in the fix is in his classmate gave it to him <laughs> Right, past Grandmaster Tyson <laughs> Russell, he, he gave it to me. But but you know what? A lot of times when when past masters go into the and in, back into the seat, yeah. you know, you, you'll hear a lot of past masters say, "Yeah, I'm here to slow the line down." But in mm-hmm. essence, they really don't do too much, right? Yeah. It's kind of like just kind of go through the. They do enough, but it's more like going through the motions. But as a past master, you should really want to go back in from a component of teaching and setting a real good example because you knew what it was like the first time around. Mm, so you yeah. want to make sure that some of the mistakes, um, because we all made our share of mistakes, we didn't always do everything right, even though we thought all of us thought we were experts in mm. the seat, but we had our share of mistakes. So we wanted to make sure that we would make better mistakes um, when we go in the second time around and put those brothers in position to be successful. You know, it, it wasn't about 
you know, us winning Lodge of the Year or, or me being Worshipful Master of the Year, um, I, I think the measuring stick was how was my successor going to do when I came out of office? And yeah. I think part of that is a reflection of whatever type of leadership I had. Um, you know, he still has to do his own thing, but if I can put him in the best position to be successful, um, his success is a part of my success. And I thought that was, you know, very, very important. And, you know, some of the past grandmasters, <laughs> you know, they joke with me at grand session because I had my past grandmasters collar in my bag, but I had my worshipful master collar and apron on when I went to our grand session after I was installed as worshipful master. So, you know, we're in our past grandmasters meeting going over the grandmasters address, you know, <laughs> brothers laughing and joking. And I said, and I told the brothers, I said, you give it time. I said, because where we are right now, we're going to need more gold collars putting focus on them silver collars because our lodges, a lot of our lodges are struggling and we need more presence in our subordinate lodges at this point, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we have? Past Grand Master Tassan Rasul Dawu mm -hmm. went back to the Worshipful Master. Mm -hmm. The current imperial, well, the, the, the next imperial potentate of the ancient Egyptian Arabic order, nobles of the Mystic Shrine, North and South America, in his jurisdiction incorporated. Thomas R. Hughes Sr. is currently the worshipful master of his lodge as right. an imperial potentate. Wow, I didn't know that. Right, right. yeah, yeah. He's he, he's the sitting worshipful master right now. Past mm. Grand Master Jeffrey Spann went in as senior warden of his lodge last year. Past mm -hmm. Grand Master Ricardo McNeil is now his lodge secretary, and at one point. He was lodge secretary while serving as our current grand treasurer. So my point is, is that, you know, if we have the energy, we have the time and we love this thing, I'm not saying that you have to go back in as worshipful master, but we have to invest more in our subordinate lodges because the grand lodge is don't, don't even exist without the quality and the substance of our subordinate lodges. Yeah, and if we want this grand lodge to be uh, quality, we need quality lodges. So you need to right. spend, yeah, yeah, and get the brothers yeah. educated and up mm -hmm. to speed and get the bar higher in the lodges that will automatically raise the bar in the grand lodge. Right. Yeah. And, you know, lodges go through their ebbs and flows, right? You know, mm -hmm. sometimes lodges are on top. They're doing some extraordinary things. And sometimes they'll be on a, you know, on a decline. It's just like a graph, you know. You know, they yeah. have their ups and downs. Um, but just like Rutger Kipling said, you know, you got to meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. You know, mm. if you if you fall too much on disaster, you know, you won't have no motivation to kind of build yourself up. If you fall too much on the triumphs, then you're not humble enough to realize that there's more work to be done and you can lose it just like that. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's, know, that's I excellent. Know, I think. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, I think I think I think that sums it up right there. I mean, okay. that's a great way to, to to get us to where we are. We are, um, you know, ninety minutes almost into our conversation. It's been a great conversation. I mean, I learned a lot. I, I appreciate the story, the openness, the honesty. Um, man, I, I'm inspired to do. Yeah. I, I, it's a lot more work to be done. So Absolutely. your leadership is already <laughs> already influencing me to do, <laughs> and I thought I'd do a lot. <laughs> and I, I, I got a lot. I got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of work to do. So I appreciate that, Pastor Grant. Thank you so much, Mark. You got something? Oh no, nah, my my thing. My thing is it's just something on my mind recently, or whatever. Just with with the relationship with the brothers that was on your line as a worship master. I'm pretty sure y'all both both y'all brothers still have a tight um, communication and relationship with those brothers, right? The yeah, that we, we, you come as when you was worship master, you know, senior war and your junior war and all that, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, but you you talking about my? Are uh, you talking about Grand Lodge or no? Your, no, your regular lodge. Your, oh your, yeah. Your, your oh, integrity, oh yeah. Integrity. Yeah, integrity. Yeah. 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 We we still we still have a tight bond. Um, mm -hmm. the the district deputy grand master who I said is on his way to getting his emeritus status. Yeah. Um, who was in my class? Um, mm -hmm. he served as senior warden when I was worshipful master. Okay. Um, the current worshipful master, mm -hmm. that's our worshipful master right now, he was his first time around, he mm -hmm. was the master. I was the senior warden, and brother Isaac, our deputy, was the junior warden. Um, right. we had I mean, yeah, yeah, we had an outstanding, I mean, but like I said, during that time, we had a solid foundation during that time. And um, you know, we had a strong past master support system as well. 
and you know, right now we still have a relationship. You know, me and brother Isaac, who's our deputy, we have a love hate relationship. You know, we we have our share of battles and our differences in opinion, but I know I can count on him, and he knows that he can count on me. And um, and I was blessed and fortunate to have an outstanding grand cabinet when I was grandmaster. Um, you know, we had. I was blessed. I'll just leave it at that. I was tremendously blessed um, with the line I had and the Grand Lodge officers I had. Oh, uh, definitely. And um, we thank you again, Past Grand, for coming on the show. Just want to uh, you gave us a lot of jewels that we want to make sure that we remember. Things like you know, officer meetings are important. That's one thing we don't mention too often. Make sure you're meeting with your officers. You have to be purpose driven. And make sure you empower other people in order to uh, for the large and the organization to grow. Something that I very found can um, have the ability to connect with people. You know, uh, one thing you did mention that was very nice. Some uh, wait, we start. you have to have the ability to start the flame in others that other that it can't be put out. So that's you know a motivational type thing, mm -hmm. in which is um, the things that we need to work on when you're coming up the line and remember those type of things and also. The, the, what I what I phrase is the keys of the past master's heart. Make sure you could doing the, the, the traditions of the, which a lodge has now before you even think about trying to change anything <laughs> like that. Just keep Absolutely. those things up, and um, you know that way you can get people on your side and continue to grow in um your lodge. And we thank you for that, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. Think about your parents, right? Your parents didn't give you the keys to the car until they knew that you were responsible, right? That you were going to do the right thing with their vehicle. You wasn't going to crash it. You wasn't going to get in trouble. You wasn't going to do no speeding. You wasn't going to get no tickets. So that took some time for them to build that trust before those, they turned those keys over. And I think past masters are the same way. They're just not going to turn the lodge over to you just because you have two or three great ideas. They want to know if you're committed, if you care, and you're dedicated to the cause of craft masonry and the lodge. Excellent. Excellent. Anything else, Mark? No, nah, that was it. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. No, this has been fantastic again, Pastor Grandmaster. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your energy. Um, this has been one of those episodes. This is one of those ones right here. Yeah, this is yeah, definitely yeah. one of those ones. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, as always, we appreciate everyone that's paying attention, that's listening, that's tapping in to our show, um, the Masterful Conversations podcast. We appreciate all the love and support. Again, this is one of those episodes. Please like, share, subscribe to the channel pass this around to as many people as possible especially if you found value in it uh, whether you're in the craft or not in the craft um, there's definitely some leadership lessons that were conveyed throughout our, our time here today um, as we always say uh, at the end of these conversations leadership the world needs leaders and leadership begins with leading yourself it's almost impossible for you to lead other people if you cannot lead yourself. So please take the lessons that you learned today, apply them to your life, apply them to your lodge, apply them to your family, apply them to your profession, any way that you can help to make this world a better place through your leadership will be valuable. So until the next time, everyone, take care. All right, brothers. Peace, man. Peace.